Good evening and uh, welcome to this, the third in this series of inaugural public lectures and, uh, and BU is very excited to be hosting this one here this evening. So I'd like to thank uh, JP Morgan Chase and in particular Simon Broadbridge for allowing us to be here this evening. Now we're very proud of the research that we do at Bournemouth University and in the latest research assessment exercise 96% of our research was recognised as internationally excellent and 18% of that was deemed to be world leading and world leading is the highest possible category you can achieve. BU has also just entered the top 500 in the Times Higher Education World University rankings and actually just after Christmas we entered the top 200 in the Times Higher Education uh, most international world university rankings as well. So these two achievements are just recognition, along with our research assessment uh, performance, of our growing standing and stature internationally. BU's vision is to uh, create, through partnerships such as the one with JP Morgan, um, a very strong uh, regional connection uh, that links directly into our international footprint. Um, so this partnership with JP Morgan is great in so many different ways. Uh, we work closely together both in the community, uh, both in business engagement projects, but also uh, they are a key employer of our graduates. So um, our central role at Bournemouth University is the creation, development and creation of global talent. Um, and JP Morgan are a recipient and a, a co-creator um, in developing that global talent for us. At BU, our vision is to be world-leading, but we need to also create world-leading and world-class facilities. So a bit like JP Morgan here, we're investing £250 million in our facilities. We're creating some fantastic new spaces. So if you've been uh, past either of our campuses, either the one in Lansdowne or the one in Talbot recently, you will have seen some cranes and some new buildings going up. So we've recently opened a new student centre, um, a new international college, and we're about to open in the next few weeks a new uh, fusion academic building. Now, fusion um, is our core academic concept of the university, and it is the integration of research, education and professional practice. And it's something we hold very dearly so that the next building we're going to open is a, a physical embodiment of that academic model, which will bring those three component parts together. Um, so we're very excited um, in our physical investments. Uh, we're also very excited about our intellectual investments and, uh, and the speaker this evening, Professor Nigel Jump, is uh, one such investment. So uh, we have appointed to uh, many academic positions in recent months, including at professorial level, and, uh, and Nigel is an example of that. So he's going to be uh, speaking tonight to us on the topic of regional economics and development and how economists are often split into those who look at the macro factors and those who look at the micro factors. So... Please join me in uh, welcoming our speaker for this evening, uh, Professor Nigel Jump. Good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here, I think. <laughs> um, what I'm going to try and do is talk about economics and its role in the development world. That's where I've spent most of my life. And the reason why it's called It's the Local Economy, Stupid... Those of you who are old enough will remember when Bill Clinton was fighting George Bush Sr. for the presidency of the United States. He used that phrase as his slogan because the economy at the time, in the summer of that year of the election, looked relatively weak in the U.S. And he kept saying, George Bush doesn't know how to run an economy, and I do. And that's one of the reasons he got elected. And um, with Hillary now running for the presidency, I expect a similar kind of language to come out over the next six months. Of course, the statisticians and the economists were lagging a bit behind what was happening in that year. And in fact, if we'd known the state of the economy in the summer and autumn of that election year, George Bush Sr. may well have won a second term because the economy was actually starting to grow, starting to develop, starting to move quite nicely. And if we'd known the numbers at the time. So the problem with economics is that we're always driving looking in the rearview mirror. And especially at a local level, because the statistics and the, and the data is really poor at that level relative to the, to the national macro level. So I've spent most of my life looking at these kind of issues as, a, as an economist. I've had a portfolio career in economics featuring those things. Growth in the environment, development and risk. That's what I've been doing uh, through my career. These are the different kinds of institutions I've worked in. I like to think that I've covered the range. I've done academic work. I've done corporate work, including many years working for international banks, so I know what it's like to work in places like J.P. Morgan. I've uh, worked for a charity in the UK, an environmental charity. I've worked in the public sector, in a government agency. 
I've been an entrepreneur for a few years um, recently, and now I'm back to academic career again. I had visiting professorships at Bath University and at Plymouth University, and now obviously this appointment at Bournemouth <laughs> is a proper job. So that's a little bit about me, but what I'm actually going to talk about is applied economics. So if you're an economic theorist, you may think that, that I'm not rigorous enough in this, this, this lecture. What I'm trying to do is show how economics can be used to talk about what's actually happening in the real world, an analysis of current and expected real conditions. I've spent my career looking at markets. I've worked in the city, in the bond markets, in the equity markets, in the foreign exchange markets. I've uh, forecast economies in North America, in South America. I've worked on Switzerland for a while. I've covered risk analysis, especially in South America. And I've looked at impact analysis, particularly here in the southwest of England. I feel a bit nervous talking about the southwest of England because we're right on the border here. We're almost in the southeast of England. But my, my element of regional economics in the UK has been mainly on the southwest, which Bournemouth and Poole and Dorset are in. So I'm going to be relating international to local, macro to micro, surfing the globalization wave towards a local development matrix. Since I actually wrote that piece on my slide, there's been a few articles in the paper about it's the end of globalization. I've surfed that way for several couple of decades now. It's interesting that the world we're in now, there's a lot of people saying the globalization wave is coming to an end, which is quite an interesting um, new development that I'm hoping to follow, monitor and analyze in the years to come. So I'm going to start off with a bit of UK context, talk about the macro economy as, as it is at the moment or as it, as it has been recently. Just a couple of slides on that. The first one looks like a messy slide. Economists like charts, they like graphs. These are growth, inflation and unemployment. So if you look at the green line, that's the, the real GDP, the growth of real GDP since 1989. I've just chosen 1989 because that's the last time we had a downturn and I wanted to show the difference in scale. So we had this long period of expansion when the UK economy was growing at roughly 3% a year which was much faster than we were used to in the 70s and 80s. In fact, much faster since the Second World War. This was the long period of growth, but it all ended in tears. I hesitate to say whose fault it was. In fact, I won't say whose fault it was. <laughs> but it all ended in tears, and they were very bad tears. This is the deepest recession of my lifetime, and certainly of the lifetime of anybody here in this room. Then we've had a recovery, but it's been a fairly modest recovery. We haven't got back to the kind of growth rates that we had before the downturn. And as you see, the last couple of quarters, it's sagging a bit. And the big question now in 2016 and going into 2017 is what's going to happen to that line? Can we maintain the recovery we've had, the modest recovery we've had? Why has it been a modest recovery? To that, we can look at the blue line. Unemployment. You can see that this mild recession in the late 90s caused a big surge in unemployment. So when we came to this one and we saw how badly the economy was doing in 2008, we thought there's going to be another big surge in unemployment. We thought this number was going to go up, probably above 10, maybe even to 12 percent. And there's a lot of gloomy predictions in the media and in academic studies at that time talking about how bad it might be. But it quickly leveled off at 8 percent and it went along there for quite a while and it has subsequently dropped all the way back to where it was before the downturn. This is unusual for UK recessions. Usually, UK recessions, unemployment goes up higher and stays higher longer and then starts to come down quite late. This time, we haven't had that. So we've had an employment-led recovery. The recovery has been modest because it's been only employment-led. The other element of growth, obviously, is productivity. We've had virtually no productivity growth in the last seven to eight years. And I'll show you a chart showing that later. So the key message of this chart is the recovery has been modest, it's looking a bit weak, and it's mainly because it's employment-led. And how long can that persist going forward? I've also got the red line on there, which is inflation. Inflation was the story in the early part of my career, in the 70s and the 80s. It was the only game in town to talk about inflation. I can remember going into lectures in one of my first universities and saying, especially to an evening class, which was full of people who did proper jobs during the day, and I said to them, Inflation's caused by the trade unions, and there'd be an uproar from one side of the room. And the next week I'd go in and I'd say, inflation is caused by the Bank of England, and there'd be an uproar from the other side of the room. It was easy teaching inflation in those days. But what we've had, oops dear, sorry about that. What we've had recently is this very modest 
inflation during this long period of expansion. But then we've had two oil spikes, commodity-led inflation, and then we've had this oil decline as well, so that there is virtually no inflation in the UK economy on average. Obviously, in the housing market, that's not true. There's lots of inflation in the housing market. But that's offset by negative inflation in other parts of the, of the, of the uh, economy. So we've got this picture of modest growth, very low inflation, and quite good unemployment numbers. This is a very different picture for the UK economy than we've seen after previous downturns. When we came to 2008-2009, the politicians at the time started talking about rebalancing the economy. They, talk, they started talking about the need to change our economy. We were too dependent upon the city, which I hesitate to say in a place like this. That we needed to reorientate our, our economy back towards manufacturing and some of the other high value added activities in our economy. This chart just shows you it's a complete myth. None of it has happened at all. The red line, all I've done here is, is put the levels to an index of 100. This does not mean that, the, that these lines actually cross at that point. It's just that they both set at 100 at that point, and then we show the trend later. So we've seen this growth in services, this red line, fairly consistent throughout this period. There's the downturn in 2008-9, and there's what's happened since. And you can see very clearly that basically the trajectory has returned for services in industries in the UK. We've lost what it might have been, if you believe that that line could have continued if we hadn't had the, the slowdown. There is a gap between those two permanent lost activity in the service economy. But look at manufacturing, a much different story. We basically went nowhere despite this long period of expansion. Manufacturing output was, in essence, level throughout that period. It had a very bad recession. One of the first reactions to the downturn for manufacturers was to stop making things. If you remember, the Honda plant in Swindon closed for three months completely in 2008-9 in order to get rid of the stocks that it had built up. So manufacturing output plummeted. Since then, it has recovered a bit, but it's still nowhere near back where it was before. Manufacturing output in the latest figures is still 6.5% below where it was at the peak last time. So we're still losing manufacturing. There is a permanent, or appears to be, a permanent loss in manufacturing capacity there. And anybody who's followed the news in the last few months with what's happened in Port Talbot Steelworks and in the steelworks up in the northeast, we're still losing manufacturing capacity in this economy. I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing. I'm just reporting what is actually happening. But certainly rebalancing is not happening. We're still even more dependent on services than we were before. And we can see it in the trade numbers too. This is the goods and services trade deficit. Now the goods deficit is enormous, and then we have a surplus on services, so the net effect are still these numbers here. So you can see that during the growth period, there was this gentle, well, not that gentle, there was this steady increase in the trade deficit in the UK. Normally when you go into recession, that reverses. So normally you would expect this line to be back up here somewhere, virtually zero or slightly above zero. That's what happened in the previous two recessions. Nothing like that this time. It's been extremely volatile and the trade deficit is still huge. The current account deficit in the UK at the moment is over 5% of GDP. When I was a country risk analysis, uh, analysis for one of the international banks back in the 1980s and 90s, if we'd got a country with a level of debt, um, sorry, current account to GDP ratio that high, we would have been telling the bank to pull its money out. Luckily, we did just before Argentina cracked, if you remember 2002. So the UK is carrying a level of deficit to GDP, which would have raised alarm bells many years ago. The difference is, of course, that everybody's got these huge deficits now. All the big countries are in the same position but it's carrying an imbalance in our economy, which may come back to hurt us at some point. At the moment, we're living with it. People are still willing to put money into the UK, buy our bonds and all the rest of it. But how long can that continue? At some point, these trends have to get better or there will be a problem. So the whole point of this context for the UK is to think about the world we've got. We've got a UK economy which is growing slowly We've got no inflation. Some people are worried about deflation and even negative interest rates. We've got uh, employment, which is good. Questions about the quality of that employment, but nonetheless, the, the unemployment numbers are good. And we've got these continuing imbalances in our economy. There are imbalances in regard to the external accounts. There's still imbalances in regard to the public accounts. 
and we still have this, these high debt load ratios for some of the households in the UK. So we're going forward through this sluggish recovery, carrying these burdens. And it's that adjustment process we need to think about going forward. Given that national context, let's look at the southwest and Dorset in particular in the next couple of charts. So let's look at the employment story down here. And the headline is the one at the top. This region employs its people. Good times or bad times, we always have higher employment rates and lower unemployment rates than virtually anywhere else in the country. We don't have a problem employing people. And you can see that with the numbers here. So at the bottom there, you can see the England average, I hope. 73.6% for this, this year. It's an average over that year, which is the latest figures we have at this level. 5.3% unemployment. Virtually everywhere in the southwest has got lower unemployment than the national average. There are a few exceptions, noticeably Torbay, noticeably Plymouth. And I'm sad to say, if we broke up Bournemouth and Poole, Bournemouth would have a higher unemployment too. Poole wouldn't. Poole has very low unemployment. Together, they come out at 4.3. The rest is Dorset, 3%, virtually full employment. So Dorset does not have a problem employing its people. There might be the questions about the quality of the jobs, but it's not a fundamental quantity problem here. And you can compare different parts which interest you there. One thing to note, cities are always worse than non-cities. So within the West of England area, you can see that Bristol has higher unemployment rates than the rest of the West of England. In, in Wiltshire, you can see that Swindon has higher unemployment rates than Wiltshire. In Devon, you can see Plymouth and Torbay both have higher unemployment rates than the rest of the country, rest of the county. And similarly here, Bournemouth and Poole have higher unemployment. That's just the nature of cities. These are not numbers you need to be alarmed about. You need to just remember the fundamental message at the top. The region employs its people. So that's good news. But then we need to think about the other part of the equation, which is output and value. And here, the southwest and Dorset in particular is fairly middling. So we've got good empl employment numbers, not so good output numbers. And the results, to put those two things together, we're talking about low productivity. So this first column is the amount of output that's produced in these economies in a year, in this particular year, 2014. So it's 30 billion for the west of England, 33 billion for the heart of the southwest. These are LEP areas. If you've heard of local enterprise partnerships, these are the southwest LEP areas. And I've put in Solent as well, since it's our neighbor down there. So think of this in terms of the great bake-off. Mary Berry and her people come along each week and they make a cake. The economy makes a cake every year. This is the size of the cake that these different economies make. So we can see that Dorset is roughly half the size of the west of England, half the size of Devon and Somerset. It's roughly the same size as Swindon and Wiltshire, a little bit bigger than Gloucestershire, and about two-thirds the size of Solent. So that gives you a scale of the size of our economy here in Dorset. But more interesting is how that reflects to the population you have. So the second column takes those numbers and says, what is the GVA per head? What is the size of the cake that we've made in our Great Bake Off relative to the number of people who need to take a share of that bake, uh, cake? And here you see a different structure. So the West of England is much more productive in this sense than Devon and, and Somerset, even though Devon and Somerset has a bigger economy, just about. In terms of GVA per head, the West of England is the star performer. It's creating more value relative to its population than other areas. And that reflects the nature of the economy in that area. It reflects the, some of the industries it's got, the nature of the workforce. It reflects the local economic characteristics of that economy, which is obviously where I'm heading with my title, It's the Local Economy, Stupid. Dorset, middling. It's okay, but it's not great. <coughs> it reflects the nature of our population. It may reflect the age distribution we have. It reflects the amount of commuting that goes on. It reflects the nature of the sectors we've got in this economy. We've got some very good ones, and we've got some others that are not so good on, the, on this measure terms. The final column just puts the same line as an index. So you can see that Dorset is 14% below the UK average. That's not a terrible score. It has been better, but it's also been worse. So it's roughly where I would expect Dorset to come out given the nature of our economy, given the nature of our environment, given the nature of our population. So that's just to give you the context of the cake that we are making every year and how productive we are at doing it.
So, having looked at some of the context for the UK and some of the context for the local area, let's now look at why we go on about growth and productivity so much. Politicians do it. George Osborne will do it in the budget this week. I guarantee you that. It will be done by many people. So why do people like me go on about growth all the time? The fundamental reason is it's what we want. Most of us want growth. Why? Because our population increases. If you make a cake and you've got more people to feed, everybody gets a smaller piece. Nobody likes getting small pieces. Therefore, as the population grows, we have to bake a bigger cake in order to supply the same amount to each of those individuals. So even in an ideal world where the distribution of income was completely even across society, you would have to grow the cake in order to, if you've got an increase in population every year, which we have at the moment. But on top of that, you lay human aspirations. Most of us expect to earn more when we're 40 than when we're 20. It may be unrealistic. In some countries, it is unrealistic. But in the Western Europe and in North America, most of us expect that we will have a higher standard of living when we're older than when we're younger. That can only happen if the cake grows. Because if I have a better standard of living because I'm old, then the young person has to have an even lower standard of living to compensate for my taking a bigger piece of the cake. And it's also true about families. Most of us expect our children and our grandchildren, or hope that our, our grandchildren, will be better off than we are. I am certainly better off than both my parents were. And that has been true for most of the post-war period in the UK. Most of us look forward and we want our children and our grandchildren to be better off than us. As long as we have that motivation, and it's not necessarily fixed forever, but at the moment we have that motivation, the cake has to get bigger because the population is growing and we have this expectation that living standards will rise over time. You can only do that if you have a growing economy. So it's what we want. We can change what we want, but at the moment it's what we want. Then it's what we do. In very simple terms, we get better at doing things over time. Our skills increase. Hopefully, Bournemouth University is contributing very significantly to the increase in skills. Our technology changes so that we can produce more with the same amount of labour. We invent new ways of doing things. We invent new products. We invent new processes. All that enables the cake to get bigger. And if we don't grow the economy, the danger is that we'll have lots of people with nothing to do. Even though the economy is getting bigger, the employment base may not be doing as well. It's only through this process of increasing productivity in our economy, releasing resources for different uses, that enables this economy to keep going. So growth is what we want, and it's what we do over time. So in very simple equations, just a thought, as an economist, I've got to have a couple of equations in there, even if they're only very simple ones. So the level of output in our economy, the size of the cake that Mary Berry can make, is determined by our physical capital, the roads, the infrastructure, the buildings, the equipment, the computers, the robots, all that kind of stuff. The human capital, our skilled workforce, which is getting more skilled as time goes by. And our environmental capital, the resources we use in order to bake our cake. Very simple, bog-standard, first-year economics relationship. And then we say, well, if this changes over time, the rate of growth is determined by two factors productivity and employment. And that's what I've been talking about so far in terms of the context, getting towards this word productivity. The Office of Budget Responsibility at the moment thinks that the trend for the UK is that there, that we have a trend growth rate in the UK of about 2.3% a year. That is made up of about 0.5% a year growth in employment and about 1.8% a year growth in productivity. Frankly, that's not very good. It's much lower than it used to be. We worry about Japan slowing down from 8% to 7%. I'm sorry, China slowing down from 8% to 7%. We need to worry about the UK slowing down from 3% to 2%. That's where the, the real problem is for us going forward. But this 1.8% figure for, for productivity is much lower than many of our competitors in Western Europe, in North America, and elsewhere, much lower. The fundamental problem with the UK economy, and indeed with the Dorset economy, is a productivity problem going forward. And we can see that in the latest figures, which only came out two weeks ago. 2014, UK productivity, this time measured by GDP per hour, was 18 percentage points lower 
than the G7 average. Much lower than France, lower than Germany, lower than the US, lower than Canada. Actually, not lower than Italy. But which league do you want to be in? <laughs> and actually better than Japan, which many people are probably surprised about. Um, but nonetheless, 18 points below the G7 average. And that's the lowest, that's the biggest gap or the lowest level we've been at since this number was created in 1991. And it's falling. The last few years, it's got worse and worse. So the UK, and Dorset, a significant part of that, has this fundamental weakness, which is the productivity problem. So if we're interested in growth, what is it that's going to deliver growth? We've talked about two factors, employment and productivity. So for the next few minutes, I want to talk about the drivers of those two factors. The employment side is fairly straightforward. It's determined by the working population, which itself is dependent upon the age structure of your economy and the net migration into, into or out of your economy over time. So that's a fairly easy number for the statisticians to calculate. Then it's affected by participation. How many people in our economy are active? How many people are actually not only working, but wanting to work? Is there an element of underemployment in the economy? Are people doing jobs where they could be more productive than they actually are? Is there hidden unemployment, people who are not in the numbers? So there are a lot of issues that we can unravel in terms of participation. But at the moment, our working population is rising, our participation rates are good, and our hours are rising too. And the hours is the final factor to determine employment-led growth. Average hours has recovered, in fact, gone well past where it was at the start of the, the downturn, full-time and part-time. And there are issues about how much is it full-time, how much is it part-time, are people doing the kind of jobs they should be doing. There's issues about the quality, but not about the level of employment. But I'm much more interested in these five factors at the bottom of this picture. What are the drivers of productivity? These are the things that change things over time. These are the things that enable you not only to make a bigger cake, but also to make a better cake as the economy develops. So it's led by investment. Can we invest in infrastructure and capacity? So all these horrendous roadworks on the A338 at the moment is an attempt to improve our infrastructure so that when the job's finished, that road will be faster, better, safer, and all the rest of it. It's an investment in the productivity of the Bournemouth and Poole conurbation. The next element is innovation. Over time, we develop new products and new processes which improve the quality of the cake. The third element is skills, and this is where the university comes in. We're producing not only more graduates, but a higher quality of graduates, which can be employed by this new dynamic economy, which is going to increase productivity over time. And then we have entrepreneurship. One of the things Bournemouth University is quite proud of is that we are, a lot of our students, or a good number of our students, go on to create their own businesses in particular sectors, especially in creative and digital. But nonetheless, it's a good measure of our success over time, that people are taking risks, people are earning returns, developing the economy, raising productivity. But the final element is competitiveness. You can have the best transport system and super fast broadband in the world. You can have really good products and processes to sell. You can have a skilled workforce, second to none. You can be entrepreneurial. If you can't actually sell anything, you're dead. So the competitiveness is not just the final thing on there. It's also very important. How do we penetrate into markets? And one of the issues for Dorset is that apart from some of the real highlights of our economy, we don't export a great deal. The UK doesn't export a great deal. We've already seen the trade figures. But Dorset has a particular problem of not exporting enough. Everyone in this room can probably think of an example of a company that is, but they are the exception rather than rule. They are very good beacons for our economy, but they're not necessarily the best. They're not necessarily um, representative of the general structure of, this, of Dorset's economy. And indeed, right across the southwest. It's exactly the same across the whole of the peninsula down to Cornwall. So these five things are the things that people interested in development focus on when they're trying to think about how can we improve our economy over time. So when the local enterprise partnership in Dorset tries to do things, when the Chamber of Commerce tries to do things, when the university gets involved in regional economic engagement, these are the five things we should be trying to influence. These are the local elements that we can improve to get our economy going. Investment in physical capacity, innovation, new products and processes, a highly skilled workforce which meets the needs of the business going forward, entrepreneurs who are willing to take risks, and market penetration. Which markets do we want to be in? Are they overseas? Are they local? Are they the right technical markets? And all the rest of it. 
So a lot of my work over the last years has been very much focused on those five elements of how we can improve an economy over time. Just to ram this point about productivity home, I wanted to show you this chart. What I've done here is looked at the periods when there is a peak in the economy, and there always seems to be in the second quarter. I'm sure there's something funny with the stats going on there. It can't always be the second quarter, but nonetheless, if you look at the ONS figures, that's what it seems to show. So I basically said, set them all to 100. What happens after that? So these are productivity figures. These are GDP per hour over time. So if you look at 1990 first, productivity hardly, hardly fell at all. It was a very mild recession. We came out of the ERM on Black Wednesday, and immediately the economy took off. The markets took off. Everybody was relieved that we got out of this system, which was constraining our economy. Productivity rose steadily, so that by roughly seven, eight years, these are quarters along the bottom here, quarters after the, the peak. So roughly 29, 29 is seven, eight years, seven years after the, after the recovery. The green line is roughly 20% higher than where it was at the start. Productivity has risen by about 20% in those seven years. Then look at the red line. This was 1979. Those of us who can remember that, that was a quite a bad recession. The, the Thatcher recession, it was called at the time. And it went on for quite a while. It went on through 1979, 1980, 1981. It went on for two years, or just, just about two years. Productivity dropped quite significantly. Then it started to pick up, and it started to recover. And yet again, after seven years, it was 20% higher than the start. So it was a worse downturn, but the story was the same. Productivity falls at the start of a downturn, then it picks up and brings the economy with it over time. The blue line, 1973, those who can remember 1973, this was the three-day week, the lights going off all the time. I can remember that, just about. I was a student at the time. Um, this was an even worse recession. The fall in productivity went on for nearly three years. We didn't get back to where we started until three years, the blue line I'm looking at. But then it went up, as normal, levels out a bit at the end. But actually, for those of you who are looking carefully, you can see that that is exactly the same shape as this red bit here. That end bit is actually the start of the red line as well. It's the same period, 1979. But nonetheless, productivity was 10% higher after seven years than it was at the peak. Look what's happened this time. 2008, productivity drops, looks pretty similar to previous recessions, but it carries on below target, came up briefly above target, back down again, basically flat, 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 flat. So that seven years after this downturn, productivity has shown no increase at all. The last two quarters may be a ray of hope. This is the middle of last year. This is April to September last year. That little bit of an uptick there suggests that productivity may have started to increase in the UK economy. At last, people like me have got some good news to dwell on. But this pattern of virtually no change in productivity growth for seven years is very untypical. And that's why I'm banging on about it so much. It's been different this time. Productivity is important. We need to change it. And you'll hear the Governor of the Bank of England, you'll hear the Chancellor Exchequer next week, talking about productivity. And these are the reasons why they do that. So growth is productivity and employment, but there are some other things. It's about attitude and aspiration. It's about what do we value in our economy? How fast do we want Dorset to grow? It's about where do we want to be in five years' time or in ten years' time? What do we want Dorset to look like? So there are elements that you have to build in when you're talking about economic development in a local area over and above these high-level economic factors. Yes, we want higher productivity growth, but we also need to think about what do we want Dorset to be? It's about access and engagement. It's about have our companies and our businesses got the information they need to increase productivity? Have they got the access to credit that they need to grow their businesses or access to wealth? Is there a source of funding and a source of information that will help Dorset businesses over the long term? And people like Bournemouth University are trying to create that information flow and people like JP Morgan are willing to lend credit in order to stimulate that kind of growth. So over time, you need that kind of thing backing up your growth process. It's also about engagement. It's about which industries are you in. We have good supply chains in the aerospace sector in Dorset. We have good supply chains in um, financial services 
We have good supply chains in creative industries. We have good supply chains in tourism. There are strengths and weaknesses in our economy. Are those the right ones? How are they going to develop over time? Can they trade nationally, internationally? What markets are we going to be in in the future? So if you're a development expert, you build on this productivity story these kinds of elements. Then there's fancy word agglomeration, where economists are just saying, if you're more connected, if you're more networked, you're likely to do better. One of the reasons Bristol had those high numbers for GVA per head is that it is a more integrated, networked economy than Plymouth, Portsmouth, Southampton, Dorset, and the rest. The advantage of big cities is you tend to get those agglomeration effects, which are stronger, which tie your economy together. You tend to attract talent to those kind of places. So one of the questions for Dorset going forward is, how can we make sure we're not peripheral to what's going on in the economy? How can we make sure we're connected? How can we retain our graduates more in this part of the world so that we get these agglomeration benefits which encourage productivity and growth over time? And the final factor we have to take into account is policy itself. The government can do a lot to either help or hinder an economy as it develops. We need re regulations and property rights. We need a legal system that supports the market system. The market system cannot exist without a good, sound, legal and property rights system. It only works because if I own something, I can sell it to you, and nobody disputes the fact that I own it, and I can sell it to you. In many countries in the world, they don't have these good legal systems that enable them to trade effectively, and that's why their economic performance is significantly weaker. The second element is stabilisation policies, and by this I mean what the Bank of England does when it sets interest rates, when it does quantitative easing over time, and I mean the fiscal policy. What are the tax rates? What are the government spending rules? The whole thing about the budget this week, to me, is all about what does it mean for productivity, growth, and these other factors. And then we have the development policies themselves. And here, I'm afraid, the UK's history is not great. We have chopped and changed our development policies over time in a very strange way. We keep throwing out what we've got and bringing in a new system, and it never gets established. So the basic message there is, unlike some countries like Germany, where they've basically had a good, strong development policy system throughout the period since the Second World War, largely created by us, ironically. Okay, they've tweaked it. They've concentrated more on East Germany when East Germany came back into the fold. They've, they've concentrated on the Ruhr at different times, but they've had a, a structure of economic development policies which has um, stayed the same throughout that period. We tend to chop and change a lot. And it never does us any good. You've talked about the economy flatlining after the most recent recession. In terms of productivity. In terms of productivity. Yeah. Units, output per units. Uh, yeah. GDP per hour. If we take it as given that the working population is growing because of the amount of incoming uh, immigration or the, the population growth and so on, does that actually mean that the economy is only growing as fast as the labour? quantity of labour available, and therefore, is it, if, if so, is it true to conclude that therefore many of the advances in technology and other stimulants of growth that we've seen in previous uh, recessions it is not occurring? It's not occurring enough to increase the average. These are all averages, obviously. Yeah. So it is only increasing as much as the amount of labour we can Yeah, have. effectively, for the economy as a whole. So within that, you'll have sectors doing much, much better. You'll have some highly productive sectors that are, that are increasing productivity quite significantly. You'll have others that aren't at all. You'll have, I mean, what normally happens in a downturn is that firms, when they start off, they lose demand, output falls, and they don't change their labor force quite quickly because they think it's not going to last very long. So productivity drops, output divided by labor. Yes? And then when it, the economy starts to pick up again, they don't hire people as quickly because they're not sure it's going to last. So output tends to go up faster than, productivity, than, than employment, so productivity rises. And that's, what, that's what's happening here. Output is falling before jobs are lost, and then output is increasing before jobs are, are added. The, the difference with, with this period is that not, that normal process has not happened at all for the economy as a whole. Thank you. Um, okay. So we've talked about the state of the economy. We've talked about... Um, the nature of growth, how it's, how it's created. Now I want to talk about some of the development aspects that come out of that. Development economics is really about growth plus. 
all the stuff I've said so far tells us what about growth, why we need it, what, it, what it's made up of, and where it's doing well and where it's not doing well. But we're also interested in what that growth is for. And that growth is for incomes and living standards. It's for the quality of life and well-being. It's about equity and community. And this is where development takes it beyond simple macroeconomics. It takes it into what are the consequences of growth in our economy? What does it mean for the environment? What does it mean for land use and planning? Very key issues in Dorset. What does it mean for the competitiveness and the competition within our business sectors? What does it mean for agglomeration and clustering? So that's what I want to conclude this lecture with talking about those elements in our economy. Why do we intervene at all in the economy? If you follow the standard Economics 101 textbooks, in a perfect world, the economy will fix itself. The last thing we need is somebody to interrupt and intervene in the economy. That is one extreme view. The other extreme view, the Marxist view, if you like, is that, no, the economy tends to fail. It has inherent weaknesses and problems in it, and it needs to be adjusted by a planned approach to the economy. We live in a sort of a mixed economy. Markets do fail from time to time. We all hear about corruption. We all hear about abuses in the economic system. Governments fail sometimes. Governments do things which go wrong, which have unforeseen consequences. So those are the reasons why we intervene in local economies to try and improve them over time. And there are spatial issues. People talk about local and regional. Is there a difference between local and regional? Is there, do we concentrate on Dorset or do we concentrate on Dorset and Hampshire or Dorset and Wiltshire? What is the right sort of element that development economics needs to concentrate on? Then we have urban and rural differences. Both areas have problems in terms of economic productivity. They're different in urban areas than they are in rural areas. And that's true within Dorset as it is anywhere else. And then we have to make the choice of how we intervene. Do we intervene to support the best? I can remember a time when people said, all the money on development in the southwest should be spent in Swindon because that's the best bit of the economy. It's the most productive part of the economy. Therefore, if you put your money into Swindon, you'll get bigger bang for your buck than if you put it into Torbay. Of course, Torbay didn't like that argument. In fact, Cornwall didn't like that argument. And so, politically, it was unacceptable. But there is an argument there that should you support the best and make sure that the best parts of your economy are doing well, are raising productivity, and, crucially, are happy being in Dorset? Or do you try and improve the worst? Do you look for the parts of your economy that are doing really badly, and if you're not going to close them down, can you improve them and make them better? Do we just encourage the new? Do we spend all the money on new things in the economy? Which sounds great because you're investing in the industries of the future. Problem is, some of those industries won't, won't run. Some of them will fail. And when the government public sector is investing in industries that fail, it tends to go down badly at the ballot box. So there's elements of encouraging the new, which are good for economic development, which may not be perfect. And then there's always those who want to try and raise all the boats. And we've heard that argument politically as well. So when you've got institutions that are engaged in, in economic development, whether it's the local councils, whether it's the chambers of commerce, whether it's the university or whether it's the LEP, these are the kinds of choices they have to make about spending their money. It isn't just a case of, oh, that's a good idea, let's do it. It should be a case of, how are we going to affect the economy in these matters? And I tend to do it by looking at what I call a development matrix. Most parts of the UK, when they're talking about economic development, identify priority sectors, sectors that they think are key to the development of their local economy. For those who remember Michael Porter's analysis, it's all based on, on that kind of approach to economic development. Find out which are the good bits and which are going to be the good bits. Focus on that. But then I want to introduce this ABCD model of firm dynamics to talk about some elements of what I think are important for development too. So what's the ABCD model? It identifies different elements of the local economy. It identifies anchors. These are firms or sectors. You can do it either at a sector level or you can do it at a form le firm level, which are vital for output and jobs. So you would argue, probably, that the health service is a big employer in Dorset. It's vital for jobs. It's a key element of our economy going forward. The councils are big employers. JP Morgan is a big employer. The university is a big employer. These are all anchors to our economy. Now, over time, that can change. It doesn't mean to say we have to spend any money helping those sectors, but we need to be aware of the anchors in our economy going forward. Then we have firms and sectors that are beacons. These are the ones that are 
displaying best practice. They're the ones that other companies should be following. This is where the good practice is being shone like a beacon across your economy. How can we capture that so that more firms are engaged in that process? Then there are the catalysts. These are the firms that are doing new things. These are the people with new ideas. Your attention, please. The fire alarm is about to be tested. The alarm <laughs> test also forms part of the fire safety training. When this alarm is heard, you should immediately leave the building by the nearest fire escape and go to the assembly <laughs> area. <laughs> this is the end of the test. Thank you. <laughs> So, the catalysts in your economy are the people who are introducing change. They can be constructive or destructive. They can wipe out existing industries. They can cause unemployment in the short term. But in the long term, these are the dynamic people who are going to create the new jobs, the new industries, the new activities going forward. And then you have the drifters. These are the industries and firms who are just drifting along with the economy. They may be very important, but they're not exactly performing very well. And I hesitate to say this with John Fletcher in the room, but tourism tends to be one of those industries. It tends to be one where there's low productivity, low wages being paid, but it's very important. It's very important to Dorset, that economy. So when we look at raising productivity or intervening in our economy, we're looking at these four different characteristics of the kind of firms and sectors we've got. Where are we going to invest? We're trying to do things better in some of them, we're trying to do better things in some of them. We're trying to cooperate in order that we can compete as a local economy better. And if we're going to make a significant difference, we have to transform rather than reform our economy going forward. So this slide just identifies the matrix that I've been talking about. Down the left are the priority sectors as identified by the LEP, the local authorities and others in Dorset. They're the ones that people think are important for Dorset going forward. And across the top is my ABCD measures. You can disagree with where I've put the ticks. That's an interesting debate. This is just a stylized look at, at Dorset. So advanced engineering is an anchor in our economy. It's also a beacon. There's some really good best practice going on in there. It's also a catalyst for change. New materials, new technologies are being developed. It's an important sector in three of these things. Creative and digital is a catalyst for change. There's lots of change going on in there. We've seen that in our students. The things that they can do now are amazing compared to the things they could do a few years ago. We even had one of our ex-students pick up an Oscar at the Oscars the other day. I don't know if anybody saw that. One of our animation students was on the stage. Incredible catalyst for growth in our economy going forward. Tourism and leisure, it's an anchor of our economy, but it's probably a bit of a drifter. It's probably one that could be improved. Health and social, I think, is similar. But this is such an important one for the future, with the ageing population and the way our economy is changing over time. This is a crucial one for the future, and it may be one where we need to try and shift more into catalysts, more into beacons. Finance and business, given our hosts, it's obviously an anchor of our economy. It's obviously a beacon of best practice going forward. It may be a catalyst for change. It certainly was in 2008, 2009. <laughs> um, Education and research, that's the university across there. Of course, we do everything well. And food and drink is a beacon in your economy, but it also is a drifter in your economy. The number of times I've been told by food and drink companies in the southwest, I don't want to compete with Brizzle, let alone go overseas. <laughs> the kind of approach we get sometimes in food and drink is quite drifting along. And the key thing about this is if we can fill this kind of matrix in when we're talking about economic development in, our, in, our, in Dorset, we can assess our intervention choices better. We can consider what we're actually spending money on and say, is this going to change this matrix in a positive way? It also allows us to evaluate impact later. Most of the impact analysis that's done in this economy, and I've done a lot of it myself, is about assessing additionality. If we spend a pound in the economy, how many pounds of value does that create? So the government economists and statisticians are always calculating these kind of figures over time. What is the impact of our investment? I would argue that using a matrix like this enables you to say more about that. Are we not only having a positive impact in purely financial terms,
But are we creating an economic structure in the local economy which is good for the long term? So that the bang for the buck may be small in the short term, but in the long term we're moving these ticks around in a positive way. So that's my quick run through the economy, growth, productivity and development and what it's for. So and finally, I have one more chart. This chart is real GDP again. And sadly, it covers my life as an economist. In 1970 was when I took my first lesson in economics at school. We've had four recessions. The latest one has been a bad one. We've had this long period of growth in the 90s and 2000s. But generally, it's very volatile. Generally, that's the picture we've seen. So let's focus on these three lines at the end here. And this is where audience participation comes in. The blue line is saying the economy is slowing down at the moment. It's already slowed a bit in the four and a quarter of last year. It's probably slowing in, the, in this part of the year. It's going to slow down through this year, maybe into next year. But then it's going to recover. And we'll get back to about trend. So this is about what the OBR says the trend for the UK economy is. 2.3%, roughly speaking. So we're going through a bit of a slowdown, but it's not too bad. We can get back to trend. So that's one forecast of the future in our economy. The green line is the much more bullish one that says, no, no, you're far too negative. Yes, it's slowing a bit, but it's going to turn around very quickly. There's lots of things going on with our workforce, with our technology changes, with our markets, which are going to mean that growth can be better than we think at the moment. The benefit of having low oil prices, all kinds of things you can point to and say, things actually might be starting to pick up. On that basis, we may get to our growth rate roughly 3%, which is sort of what we did in that period there. So that's the more optimistic view that economists currently have about the economy. The red line is, oh, we're having another recession over the next two years. It won't be a bad one, but we're going to have a recession. And when we come back, we're only going to get 1%, one, 1.5% one growth. That's nothing. That's really nothing. You worry about China slowing down. worry about the UK slowing down. It's much worse. So those are three views of the economy over the next few years. Hands up those who think the blue line is the one. Come on, don't be shy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Quite a lot of you. Yeah. She's not surprised. That's the consensus. That's the view the Chancellor will give this week, I'm sure. How many are much more optimistic and think the green line? Quite a few. Good. Yeah. Tends to be the young people. Tends to be the women. But... <laughs> Yeah, less than the blue line. Less than the blue line. Who wants the red one? Me. <laughs> Not many, but they tend to be... The sensible ones. The sensible. The, the non-risk takers, shall we say. Now, the interesting thing is that a lot of forecasting and market analysis is done on that kind of basis. What do people think? What do businesses think? And when we ask businesses in Dorset what they think, we do tend to get the blue line. It tends to be the consensus view. But we need to also to be aware of the risks. We may be too pessimistic. The economy has a life of its own. It may pick up. There's things going on in our economy that may think the future is much better. Or we haven't rebalanced our economy. We've still got those bad imbalances in our economy to fix. We haven't improved our productivity over time. And without an increase in productivity over time, the cake tends to have a soggy bottom. So that's an interesting little... Vox Pop going forward. I'd like to end by thanking everybody. All of you. Be you, our hosts, blah, 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 blah. Not to mention the band at the bottom. Um, any questions? But I will not answer questions on the EU referendum. <laughs> Thank you very much.